Alrighty, we continue in our uh, study in the book, in the Bible, written by God, entitled The Acts of the Apostles. And um, it's been a great book to study because we've been taking our time. We haven't been running through it. We've been carefully walking in the Word and, and looking at what God is saying word by word and appreciating the great work that He did as He began to transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Very important. Now, tonight we'll be, or this morning we'll be looking at chapter 19 as we're going to observe as Paul begins his third missionary journey. He's been working for a while up in Galatia and Phrygia. And while he was in that particular region, way over here on the map in Asia Minor, over on the west coast in the region of the seven cities that the Lord Jesus will write letters to over in Ephesus here, there was a man named Apollos that had just visited the synagogue in that region. That would be in chapter 18, verse 25 and 26. He spake boldly in the synagogue. But he, he was teaching the very things that John the Baptist was teaching. Apollos was, had grown up in Egypt, in Alexandria. And although he knew Old Testament Scripture, he did not know of the coming and the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he had been instructing in that particular uh, region. And now when we get to the 19th chapter, here's what we learn. And it came to pass so that while Apollos was at Corinth, he left Ephesus to go to Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Well, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. And I want to stop there and we want to take a look at this passage carefully before we jump up and down and get excited and, and try and speak in tongues. We want to understand what's happening in this particular passage because there's a lot going on. And this will bring back to remembrance the teaching that we did a few weeks ago on the doctrine of baptisms. This is a transitional period going on. Now, to understand, these disciples that Paul ran into, verse 1, when he found the certain disciples, these were the disciples from the last chapter and the 26th verse. These disciples were Jewish men from a synagogue. These disciples that had been at this synagogue had a man come preach to them about the coming of the Messiah. The Jews, at that time, were waiting for the first coming of the Messiah. That's what they were waiting for. Now, sometimes when you're waiting, by the way, Christians today are waiting for the second coming of the Messiah. I hope that's what you're waiting for, Christian, that you're looking up and you're waiting for the second coming of the Messiah. Now, now what happens while you're waiting for the Messiah to come, while the Messiah tarries? One of the things that happens is you tend to um, get your eyes on the world. You tend to let your hands hang low, your shoulders shrug. Woe is me. This is rough down here. It's hard to keep going. He hasn't come yet. My father said he was coming. He didn't come in my father's lifetime. My grandpa said he was coming. He didn't come in my grandpa's lifetime. Generations have been saying he hasn't come yet. I don't know if he's ever going to come. And you know, I got these daily activities I got to take care of. I mean, I got to take care of the house and the car broke down and these things I got to do. And you know what happens is we get our eyes off of the eternal. And when we, when we get our eyes off of the eternal, we begin to... Now, it's true, folks. We walk in the flesh because we have bodies. But we're not to walk after the flesh. But then what happens is we begin walking after the flesh. And a funny thing happens when you walk after the flesh. You get into sin. You get into more and more sin. You, you speak to anyone that isn't spending time with the Lord on a daily basis, isn't spending time with God's people, and you'll find that they're getting more and more into sin. Everyone's got different types of sin. It may just be the sin of idolatry. That's a bad sin. God's not pleased with idolatry. You say, well, he's not fornicating. He's not a homosexual. He's not killing anybody. Yeah, but idolatry is a bad sin. 
And people get into sin. Now what happens is you need someone to wake them up and turn their eyes back to the Messiah. Apollos came in and said, hey, wake up, Israel. You guys are walking. You're so far down in the dust. You're like pig pen. There's just a storm around you. You've got to get back and repent. So Apollos preached repentance and looking to the Messiah. But Apollos didn't know that the Messiah had come. And when he baptized them, he only gave them the baptism of repentance. Remember, the five baptisms, the order that they come in your Bible. The first one is the baptism of repentance. It's a Jewish baptism. Jews were expected to have that. In the doctrine of baptisms, that was something they were supposed to do. Why? Because they're no different than you and me, folks. They get low and they get back in the world. And they need repentance toward God. They need to turn to God. Christians need that. We need repentance toward God. By nature, if you trust your eyes and your flesh and your heart and your senses and your emotions, you'll veer off the straight and narrow path. And we need repentance. The Jews needed this. So it was a good repentance that Apollos, a good baptism that he baptized with and a good teaching that he gave unto them. Apollos was not insincere and he was not incorrect. He was just incomplete. He didn't have the rest of the information. Now, now when Paul comes along, Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, the apostle to whom God revealed the mystery of godliness, all those mysteries that you read about are in Paul's epistles. The mysteries that are given. This is the mystery of godly, God in the flesh. The mystery of the fact that God is now putting Israel on the side. Romans 9, 10, and 11. While he's working and calling out a people unto his name that will provoke the nation to jealousy. All these mysteries. The mystery that then when God's finished with that, he'll then bring back the nation to Israel. All this is revealed to Paul. And Paul has this gospel of Jesus Christ. And he comes to here and he sees these folks, these Jews, and he says, you're disciples and, and you are very devoted to the Scriptures and you're trying to live a holy life, but, but have you received the Holy Ghost? Have you received the Holy Ghost? Now, notice, have you received the Holy Ghost? Verse 2. End of verse 2. We have not heard so much as whether there be any Holy Ghost. Now, just historically, I, I want to help you in understanding the Holy Ghost is a New Testament term. Holy Ghost is not found in the Old Testament. If you, if you search through the Scriptures and look through the Old Testament, the word ghost is only found in the Old Testament in four books of the Bible, mostly in the book of Genesis, where it speaks of with a small g, Abraham gave up the ghost. And Sarah gave up the ghost. And it speaks of people dying and giving up the life force inside of them. Because it's appointed on a man once to die. And when you die, your life force leaves you. Amen. Amen. I was talking to a young man yesterday at UB. As we were preaching, he was in a car. And he pulled the car over and rolled the window down, motioned me to come over. And we, we got to talking. And, and uh, he's a student there. And I explained to him, you know, you have a, a, a life force inside of you. A host, a godly host, and G host, okay, ghost, inside of you. It's got a spirit and a soul. And when that leaves your body, you're dead. And when it leaves your body, it only has one or two places it can go. Okay, it can either go to heaven or hell. There is no third other place for that thing to go. Now, the ghost is mentioned in the Old Testament speaking of people's life force inside of them. In the Old Testament, you won't even find the word Holy Spirit with a capital H and a capital S. You'll find in a few mentions, if you want to turn there, you can look. One in Psalm 51, the other in Isaiah 63. The mention of something called the Holy Spirit. But it's holy with a small h and spirit. And it's referring to the Spirit of God. God revealed Himself to the Jews and told them in the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And the Jews had a monotheistic religion. It's the only religion God ever established on planet earth. God has no second religion. It was given to the Jews. It was monotheistic to teach all the nations that were polytheistic around them that there is one Lord, there is one God. But what was concealed in there was the triune God, the mystery that is revealed in the New Testament. That is why, turn to Matthew 28. 
when you get to the New Testament, that which is concealed in the old is revealed in the new. And Jesus says to the eleven disciples in Matthew 28, verse 16, the eleven disciples, these are the apostles that were left after Judas had departed and hung himself. The ones that stayed with Jesus and saw Him in His resurrected body. Verse 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto Me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And what is revealed now in the New Testament is the wonderful, blessed, eternal, all wise and true doctrine of the Godhead. And that's not a man-made doctrine. Because you won't find any other religion with anything like it. Three persons in one. That's a revelation from God. And Jesus says, now the time has come that all nations need to be baptized. You mean, you mean like dunk them in water? No, we saw baptism as identified with. Association with. They were baptized unto Moses. They were following and identified. He says you need to get them to follow and identify with the reality that God is three persons in one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The great three in one. And you need to go out and teach them that. You need to immerse their minds in that concept. They need to know the truth. If they're polytheistic, they're lost. If they're monotheistic, they're lost. They must understand the Godhead. That's the reality. Well, I, you know, I believe in God. And Jesus was a form of His Son, but He wasn't really God. Wrong. Baptize them in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, understanding that these three persons in one God had... That's it. That's it. If you don't believe that, you don't have the Jesus of the Bible. You've got another Jesus, 2 Corinthians 11. i got news for you. He can't save you. I know people that have another Jesus. And there's such confusion today. Now, Jesus, this is a commission. This is the commission given. When you go out, you need to make people understand that there's a Father in heaven. There's the Son that walked on earth and now He's back in heaven. And there is the Holy Ghost. And those are the names that are given. And so Paul arrives and he says, you seem to have a tender heart, but let me baptize you in a concept that you don't seem to understand. Jesus is the Christ. And the Godhead is a wonderful, glorious mystery that's been revealed to us. What do you think of that? The word Holy Ghost is a New Testament term. In the New Testament, you will find the Holy Ghost mentioned 90 times. 90 times. The word Holy Spirit is found only once in the New Testament with a capital H and a capital S. Now, if you want to be biblical... If you want to be biblical, what we need to train our tongues and our lips to say is the Holy Ghost. If you want to be Christian, you'll talk about the Holy Spirit. But He's only mentioned one time in the New Testament. His name is the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said, this is what you must baptize them and immerse their minds in that concept. Get them used to that. And then Paul came and met a bunch of people that seemed to want to follow God. And he said, you don't seem to have this concept correctly. Let me reveal what Jesus gave to us. And so he brings forth the concept of the Godhead, Jesus being the Christ and the Holy Ghost. We've not heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Well, we've heard it. And then our job is to publish and proclaim it. The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. That's, when I was a kid, they had a cartoon show about a friendly ghost. I guess the Holy Ghost is a friendly ghost. His desire is to tell you about someone that will be a friend unto you. Someone that will save you from your sins. He would like to, to guide you into all truth. Would you, would you enjoy that? Then we want to tell you about the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. So, so J Paul arrives there and he finds out that they only have this baptism, and this is the order it's given to Jews, the baptism of repentance, but they haven't learned of the baptism of the remission of sins in Jesus Christ. So I'm, I'm certain that Paul explained in verse 4 that the one that comes after is Christ Jesus. 
Okay, John told you to get ready for the Messiah. Let me tell you who the Messiah is. It's Jesus of Nazareth. He is the Christ. And thankfully, these Jews had a tender heart and wanted to receive truth. Oh, that it would be like that every time we went out and told people the gospel. I mean, that we, isn't it wonderful when once in a while you find someone with a tender heart that wants to know truth? That's rare, you know. I, I'm, sure, I'm sure God has done a lot of labor on them. There's been a lot of sowing and a lot of watering and a lot of sowing. And you get to one of those harvest-ready pieces of fruit to come off. What a blessing. Well, this was one that was harvest-ready. This was one synagogue with 12 disciples that were ready to follow Jesus Christ. So, when he told them about Christ Jesus, verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's another thing they had to get used to. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. Why? Because they thought it was Lord, don't say the name. Lord Tetragrammaton. Lord, we don't mention it. Lord, and, and if you go to Romans chapter 10, which is written specifically to the Jews, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, Paul's talking to Jews. He's talking to Jews. My heart's desire and prayer to, for Israel is that they might be saved. My brethren have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And what I'm trying to show them in these verses is out of their mouth they must confess the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus. They need to understand that the Lord is Jesus and Jesus is the Lord and that's the only Lord that God's going to accept nowadays. You want a relationship with God? You must come through the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul's baptizing them in that concept. He's immersing their minds in it. I believe also they were water baptized secondarily. But the first baptism was of the mind and of the spirit. Folks, your mind and your spirit has to get this thing. I remember I had to in 1993, March, April, May, June. Yeah, I'm really dumb. I'm slow. I'm thick. But in August, then I got water baptized. But it took a while to immerse my mind and my heart in the concept of the Lord Jesus. Not the man from Galilee, not the one you go hand in hand with, uh, not, not the guy on the dusty roads with the sandals, but the Lord, the Lord Almighty. I mean, as I, as I read through and they took me through that gospel over and over and then every sophomore in the gospel and jumped to another book and I'd see a little bit more and more and more of Jesus was unveiled and then I realized this is God Almighty that came in the flesh. And He's not in the flesh anymore. He's the Lord and He's the only hope I have. And then I bowed the knee and then I got water baptized in August. But that's after my heart was immersed in the concept that Jesus is the Lord. By the way, that's, that's what the Bible says. It says no man can confess that Jesus is not Lord, the Lord. There's only one. He's not one of many lords, like George Harrison thinks. My sweet Lord, Hare Krishna. My sweet Lord, there's many, many lords, many. No, there's one Lord, the Lord Jesus. And Paul is taking these Jewish men and explaining to them everything that you've been waiting for, everything that you've been worshiping has come in the person of Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Lord Jesus. So they were baptized in that name because that's the name above all names. That's going right back to Acts 2. That's the baptism that's needed. You, you've got to understand that. It, it, in, in Christianity today, it's such a mess. It's such a mess. There, there's this <laughs> preacher on. He smiles all the time. I love him. He's a blessing to me. But, but you're not going to get saved listening to him. But if you're already saved and you want a positive message, turn him on. And he wrote a book recently about how to, seven ways to become a better you or something. And they were doing the book uh, tour with him. And I, I saw him being interviewed one day. And somebody asked him about, you know, politics. And, oh, yeah, I like politicians too. Well, what do you think of Mitt uh, Romney? He's a Mormon. And uh, does that trouble you because you're a Christian? Oh, no. He confesses that Jesus is, is his Lord. And, and that's just fine by me. I don't make any distinction with that. And anyone that confesses... No, that's another Jesus. That's another Jesus. There's only one gospel. There's only one Jesus. There's only one Spirit that you'll receive when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And we need to be immersed in the truth. And it comes from the Word of God. Faith is the victory. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. If it weren't for this book, we're all adrift on the ocean of humanity, which is going over a cliff on a waterfalls. It's this book that pulls us back. This is the ark of our safety. And so, so he's baptized. He's immersed in the concept that it's Jesus Christ is the Lord. That's the name. And then, at this point, verse 6, Paul laid hands 
on them and the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and they prophesied. Again, these men are Jews. Laying on of hands was something that God had given to the Jews all the way back to the days of the tabernacle in Leviticus and Exodus. And the laying on of hands was a way that, that God used the apostles to transfer the Holy Ghost to Jewish men. And the sign that they now had received the Holy Ghost was these Jewish men spake with tongues and prophesied. They did both. First they spake with tongues. Why? Tongues are for a sign. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 and 14, verse 22. Tongues are for a sign and the Jews require a sign and God was giving a sign to them. Why? Because at this particular time, there still wasn't a New Testament. Paul couldn't pull out a pocket New Testament and say, here, take this, read the Gospel of John. It won't be written for another 40 years. So God had to confirm to these Jewish men who had put their faith in 1,500 years of scriptures that God was doing something new. And he said, I'm going to give you a sign. And the sign was given. Amen. Can you do that? Well, are you a Jew? Is there no New Testament available to you? Is there an apostle around to lay hands on you? Okay, we've got, let's see, there's three no's. We've got three out of three. When three strikes, you're out. You can't do it. You can't do it. You won't do it. Nobody's doing it today. This is a historical book. Joey, get this for television so they can see this. They, they, You've got to understand this. Someone's deceiving you. Someone's preaching another Jesus and sending you another spirit and it's not the Holy Ghost. It's another spirit that's giving you this deceiving work, making you speak in, in gibberish that isn't biblical tongues. Biblical tongues are languages. So, so we see this historically written here. I think this is a blessing. I think this is wonderful. Twelve Jews came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. I wish that would happen to us. I wish we could go and get twelve Jews saved. That would be wonderful. And if they spake in tongues, I guess they need a sign. I don't know. I can't lay hands on them. Nothing I can do. But this is historical. So we understand this as we read it. Now, now Paul's in Ephesus. And Paul's going to start to plant a church in Ephesus. Now, now there's going to be a lot of work that's going to be done here. Verse 8. So he went into the synagogue where there were other Jews and spake boldly for the space of three months disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. The Jews were promised the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is doing something new, the kingdom of God. He's telling the Jews, you know, it's possible to get in the kingdom of heaven with your fleshy birth. And, and we'll see people in the kingdom of heaven that have only been born of the, of the water. Fleshy birth. We'll be there in the millennium, folks. You'll be there. You'll see them. There'll be many of them. All they'll have is a fleshy birth. How will you know? Well, when the devil's loosed in Gog and Magog, you see how he rounds them all up. That's all they have is a fleshy birth. There will be many in the kingdom of heaven born only of the flesh. But Paul says, you know what? The kingdom of God, you must be born again. You must not only be born of the flesh, you must be born of the spirit. And he's trying to persuade them the necessity of the new birth. The same way Jesus worked with Nicodemus. It's religious people that kick against the new birth. Today it's religious Christians. Like the one man said to me, it was when we were preaching yesterday, another Oriental grabbed me and he said, I'm from China. He said, I don't understand why you're preaching here in America. Aren't all Americans Christians? I said, no. He said, well, they say they're Christians. I said, a lot of people say they're Christians. I said, son, on this planet, there's 1.2 billion people that claim they're Christians. But how many have Christ inside of them? How many have been born again? I said, son, you must be born again. We're preaching this message here to quote-unquote Christians because most of them are not born again. And so the things concerning the kingdom of God is except a man be born again, he will never enter the kingdom of God. Except you be born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Well, the kingdom of God is revealed in the pages of this scripture. You're not born again, you don't understand this book. I know because I was not born again at one point in 1986, 87, 88 when I was reading through it and I didn't understand any of it. I couldn't see it. But in 1993, when I was born again, now I read through this book and I can see the kingdom of God. And what a blessing. I can see it by the eye of faith. And one day I'll see it and enter it with a spiritual body. 
But you must be born of the Spirit. So Paul's persuading. He's reasoning. We need to reason with people. We need to persuade people. Use the art of persuasion to baptize them in the name of the Lord Jesus in the new birth. What happens when you do that? Verse 9. But diverse were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude. Look, if you're going to stand for truth, the devil has people to stand for lies. It's just, it's just the battle that rages on planet Earth. It's a battle for hearts and souls and minds. And we have the truth. And the deceiver has lies. And it would be nice if we could just go out there and there would be no gainsaying. But expect gainsaying. We had people that gainsayed yesterday when we preached. Didn't stop us from preaching. We continued to preach for the others so that they could hear. I, I, there was a battle raging by the bus stop there. As my son was preaching truth and another boy was preaching something else and I would intervene every so often when you would walk the other way and throw some more truth that way and they were going back and forth and they, and they had an opportunity to make a discernment and a choice between truth and error. But we were giving them truth. But this is going to happen. You're going to have people hardened. You're going to have people believing not. You're going to have people speaking evil. Now what happened? Verse 9, Then Paul departed from them, middle of verse, and separated the disciples, disputing daily in, one, in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now, here's what you want to do. When you finally get people that are believing the word of the Lord, you know what you like? You like to be able to come to a place where you're separated from the babble of other voices and the gainsaying, where there's a place where, where the Spirit of the Lord can have liberty and you can teach like that. You mentioned how difficult it would be if a lot of those folks started coming in here and disputing with us when we're preaching and teaching. But here we have a place where we can be separated and we can come out from among them and the Word of the Lord can go forth and you can still your heart and your spirit and you can grow. Paul realized these, these disciples need growth and they're not going to grow in the midst of all this confusion. There's too much confusion here. There are too many voices going on. Too many people staying, standing up saying, I have a word of knowledge and speaking in something that nobody understands. Let, let's separate them and get them to a place where I can teach them. And he did that. But amazingly, somehow, this man Tyrannus that had a school in the area still allowed Paul to come to teach at his school. Turn to 1 Corinthians 16. You see, in the region of Asia Minor, there were three great centers. There was Smyrna, which was a great commercial center, and much commerce went on. 1 Corinthians 16. And there was Pergamos, or Pergamum, which was a great religious center. But Ephesus was the great political center. This is where they trained the young governors and procurators and politicians. And they had a school there where they trained them. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Paul is saying to the church that it is his desire to come and be with them. Verse 3, and when I come, you know, he is a desire to come. Uh, verse 5, now when I come unto you, when I pass through Macedonia, I, you know, he really wants to come and be with this church again. Verse 6, it may be that I will abide, yea, winter with you, that you may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. Verse 7, for I will not see you now by the way. Why is that? Uh, verse 8, I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. Verse 9, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me. That's that school of Tyrannus. God had opened an opportunity for Paul to get into a place where they were training young politicians, they were training young leaders, and somehow he was given an opportunity to get in there and do some teaching. And God opened a great door unto him. That's an amazing thing. You know what? God opened some great doors for you and me. We get opportunities to go to a place where there's a Tyrannus, a, a tyrant. Ty tyrannus is the word for tyrant. There's a tyrant running a place. And there's a bunch of little sheep in there being sheared constantly with lies and errors. And all of a sudden, you get an opportunity to be in that place where you can put forth truth. Now, there's going to be disputing. There are going to be many adversaries. 
but you still have the opportunity to give forth the truth. I don't know where you work, but you might be in a, in a workplace of a Tyrannus as opposed to a school of Tyrannus. And it is a school because they're training them in the wrong things. And you may have an opportunity right there. I, was, uh, I took care of a professor this week, a lady professor from Buff State. I had an opportunity to teach at the hospital, and, and some people were asking me to teach again, and uh, this lady overheard. And so we were talking, and uh, her husband's a professor at Buff State, too. And so we got to talking, and I said, you know, I'm thinking, you know, winding down in medicine, but what I might do is, is, is become a teacher and go to, you know, a college or a university. She said, you'd be great. We would love you at our place. She said, with your degree and the fact that uh, we have a pre-med curriculum, you could be a teacher in biology, I could get into the school of Tyrannus. That'd be an effectual open door for me. I mean, right now at the workplace, I might talk to one person here and one person there, put me in a classroom with 50 or 60 people every day, and that's my job. <laughs> Let me at it. I, I said, yeah, well, you, I said, that's an idea. I'll talk to you. So I got her number, and I, I'm going to talk with her and her husband. And, uh, and maybe that's what I'll do for a while. If God will open a door for me to go into the school of Tyrannus and put out the truth, I'd love to do it. There's a lot of lost kids at those colleges. They get a lot of facts. They get no truth. What an opportunity. The school of Tyrannus. I, I thought that was interesting. The school of Tyrannus. The one school of Tyrannus. Turn to Job chapter 41 and, uh, and Isaiah 27. Get those two uh, chapters in your hand. Uh, Job 41 and Isaiah 27. I don't know. I just think of these things when I'm reading the Bible. The school of Tyrannus. Yeah. The king of the dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus. Rex. It's interesting. Um, Job 41 is a long chapter written about some being known as the Leviathan. Job 41. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook? It's a lot of questions that the Lord is asking. But if you kind of, I don't know, pray and look into there, you get some information about this Leviathan. Who is this Leviathan? Anybody know who it is? Well, that's what Isaiah 27 will tell you if you have a King James Bible. Isaiah 27 will explain to you, uh, Isaiah 27, 1, In that day the Lord with His sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent. By the way, that's only in the King James Bible. You want to know why people are getting body piercings all over the place? They're, they're going after their father. They don't realize that. I was trying to teach that one day to a group of people doing a Bible study at the hospital where I used to work. And I said, do you want to know what all this... They, they, they said, we don't understand where all these body piercings are coming from. I said, Isaiah 27.1. So they opened their NIVs. They said, we don't know what you're talking about. And I went over and looked and I said, oh my goodness, it's not there. So I said, well, let me give you God's Bible and He'll reveal it for you. That Leviathan, that piercing serpent is the crooked serpent, the dragon that's in the sea. The dragon of Revelation 12. That's the devil. That's Satan. That's who Leviathan is. And Isaiah 40, or, or Job 41 is a, is a chapter where you can learn a lot about this Leviathan. And uh, we've taught little bits and pieces of it. I will not conceal his parts, Revelation 13.1, nor his power, Ephesians 2.2, nor his comely proportion, 2 Corinthians 11. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in that chapter. But notice how that chapter ends. In the 1800s, when the devil was really at work, putting out false religions like uh, Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses and, and, and crazy doctrines of uh, Mary being assumed up into heaven and all this kind of stuff. They was really working full-time and putting out crazy political theories through Karl Marx called communism and stuff. And just working full-time and taking Bibles and ripping them to shreds and putting forth new Greek manuscripts and all this kind of stuff. Uh, he also had some scientific people doing work on uniformitarianism and something called uh, archaeology and paleontology, and they invented this new term called dinosaur. That's just a neologism. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, dinosaurus. Uh, so, uh, saurus, dinos is old, and saurus is lizard. And then they took every lizard they had and they put a name in the front and stuck saurus on the end of it. And they came up with one Tyrannosaurus, that's tyrant lizard. And they called him the king of all the dinosaurs. They called him Tyrannosaurus rex. Uh, Job 41, verse uh, 
A lot of good stuff in this chapter. I just want to teach it, but I can't. We don't have time. Uh, Verse uh, 34. 33, upon the earth there's none like him, not his like, who is made without fear. You see those signs, no fear, on the bumper stickers? They're being like the Father. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. They're being like their father, the devil. Verse 34, he beholdeth all high things. You know, the things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God? That's him. He is a king over all the children of pride. Tyrannosaurus Rex. You know what the schools are run by? The Leviathan. It's the school of one Tyrannus. Teach you how not to know God. Teach you, give you pride. You're going to dispute in that place. You've got young ones and they're in public schools. You need to pray over them. You need to train them in the truth. You need to root them and ground them in the truth because they're going to have the winds of doctrines blowing against them. I wouldn't even recommend sending a young child to a public school. I wouldn't recommend it. I don't think they're ready. They're too young to bear the winds of the disputes and the doctrines they're going to face. But by their high school ready, if you've been training them right, by the time they're 13, 14, 15, if they've got a good mind, they can go in the school of Tyrannus. They can hold their own if they're walking with the Lord. But that one school of Tyrannus, that's, that's the school of the one Tyrannus. That's what's going on nowadays. That's modern education. And there's a dispute. But you know what? There's a great and open door There are teachers in those places. And I pray that they're being like Paul. And they they continue. And so much so, it says that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. Both Jews and Greeks. The Lord wants our light to shine. And He opens great and effectual doors for us. Sometimes we inadvertently close them or walk the other way. And Paul is a picture. You say, well, that's Paul's missionary journey. Hey, you got a missionary journey. I've got a missionary journey. These things are written for our example. And we need baptized people in the name of the Lord Jesus and the Holy Ghost. Understand the Godhead and their need for salvation. And we need to dispute. And if diverse are hardened and believe not, so what? We'll separate with the disciples and we'll go back out. And let that door stay open as long as God Leaves it open. Now what happens with Paul, verse 11, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the the sick handkerchiefs or aprons that had been on the body of Paul. And the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now look it. The word special is only found in your Bible two times. This is the second mention. The first mention is Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. Let God fix these words for you and understand this. This isn't for you. You can't repeat this. I can't repeat this. Even Peter couldn't do the miracles like this. These were special miracles that God was letting Paul do. So why don't we just believe God for what he wrote and just worship him and thank him? Aren't you thankful that he had an apostle like Paul that did what he did? I bet a lot of you are saved because of Paul's writings. And if you're not saved because of Paul's writings, I know you're growing in grace and knowledge because of Paul's writings. So thank the Lord that there was an Apostle Paul that he used. But don't try and imitate him. You're not to imitate anybody. You're to follow Jesus. Deuteronomy 7. This chapter where the Lord is explaining to the nation Israel that, verse 1, the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest. It's going to be God's work choosing that nation, choosing that land, choosing that people of whom His Son will come through. Verse 6, Thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto Himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. That's the kingdom of heaven on earth. See, the face of the earth there, heaven is above, and the Jewish people got the kingdom of heaven. They're going to be above the people on the face of the earth. That is written Deuteronomy. It's a book of Moses written to Jews. It's not written to you. It's not written to me. Don't don't look at me mad. That's just the truth. Now, if you're a Jew, maybe you can get a little mad at me, but get happy about it. (laughs) Because God's choosing you of the seed of Abraham. Now, you and I, He's saving as part of a wild olive branch and grafting us in. And that's good enough for a Gentile dog like me. I'm thankful for my salvation. And I'm not angry that God chose the Jews. But that's Jews. 
They're the special people. And Paul, as he defended his apostleship in every epistle, was of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, an Israelite indeed, a Jew of Jews, and God chose that Jew to do special miracles. Not me. None of you. And none of you out there watching. So the, the book of Acts is historically showing us what God did. Now this is where some dirty, rotten, low-down, quote-unquote Christians take a verse like this and, and take handkerchiefs and send them out in the mail and ask for money based on a verse like this. And the people that do it aren't even Jews. And most of them aren't named Paul. And none of them are old enough to have been around during this time. So if you're a Christian and you have a Bible, you understand. It's just a charlatan. It's a, it's a false apostle. 2 Corinthians 11. Now the people in Ephesus were smart enough to figure that out. Because when Jesus wrote them an epistle, He said, you know, you try those that say they're apostles and, and they're not. You're smart enough to know that. The people in Ephesus weren't fools. Why is it the Christians of today have become so foolish? Who's bewitched you, Christian? I mean, we read this and we understand this is happening in Ephesus. If you want to be like the Ephesians, then why don't you, those that, are, that say they're apostles, why don't you try them? Try the spirits, try them through the Scriptures. See if what they do is lining up with Scripture. And if it's not, and you find them not, find them what they are to be, liars. You know, people lie in the name of the Bible. People lie in the name of Jesus Christ. People lie in the name of a gospel, which is not the gospel, it's another gospel. Don't be surprised. There are liars out there. But here we read the historical event of what God did, uh, making special miracles through Paul's hands. It's miraculous. I'll tell you something. The Lord very well may do something like this in the tribulation. He may, he may bless through the 144,000. He may allow them to go out and heal Jews that have been wounded by the Antichrist, that have been shot, that have been hurt, that have been injured. That are, that, are being, that are being tormented as all those, those uh, locusts that aren't locusts and all those devils are let forth out of the pit and are running around here tormenting people's spirit and soul. It, it, he may let the 144,000 do it. But none of us are part of the 144,000. But praise God that He's willing to work with the special people that He's chosen unto Himself in the land. Amen. We're running out of time today. So we'll finish up here at the paragraph marking in the 19th chapter in verse 12. Just, just observing that the most important thing we read in that chapter was that the people needed to be baptized, immersed in the concept that Jesus is the Lord. He's the Lord. Who are you following today? Who are you trusting in today? Like Jesus said to the apostles one day, where, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Well, prayerfully, it's in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That, that spirit that will cry, Abba, Father, inside of you. And the gift of eternal life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the acts of the apostles and the wonderful history, Lord. And, and just the, the truth that, that it's Jesus. We must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And help us, Lord, as we go out there in the school of one Tyrannus, that if you open the door, Lord, that we will preach the gospel. If others dispute, that you will give us the strength. Uphold us, Lord, by thy spirit. Make us bold to open our mouths. Help us to reach out to others in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The name that we pray in. Amen.